The problem was we were unhappy with the current race speeds of the Formula One air races. This is the aircraft we had last year. Mm. Let us do one incremental change and then race that. There was no, like people were just kind of edging up the times because we wanted to basically take everyone's ideas and just make th an amazing thing. Hmm. Do you make toast better than you make aircraft? <laughs> Hosting design, Shaka Shekman, Michael Burr, and joining us for the first time, Mr. Constantine Schulte Breda. Is that correct? Close enough. Good stuff. I'm happy with that. Uh, and today, what we're going to be talking about is the fourth year projects, specifically fourth year projects that will be coming in in 2020. Yeah. So fourth year design projects are what is known or what are known as a capstone project. It is the sort of pinnacle of your your career at university. And believe it or not, none of the courses really prepare you for it. Well, can't um, say that. Shouldn't say that. They do technically well, they prepare do, you. Well, they do, but design is that, that cool stuff, which is, you know, they don't the touch. art of, of, of being a chef. Yes. It, uh, it ties gotcha. it together. Yes. So yeah. a, a, a design project is not where you start with chemistry and physics and maths and then try and do an element of every single sort of uh, part of it. Uh, well, they're sort of two months and a week long. Mm. Uh, they can be done sort of individually or, or as a group. Um and, and they are basically the preparation which prepares you to work in industry. Or oh, it's, your, it's your show of evidence that you can work in industry. Yeah. Because if you can pass those in, we're saying, yes, you can do design out there in the big real world, ethically and professionally and cool. Uh, now, with, with those projects then, as students, the students, at least in the current way it's run, you propose your own project, um, provided you then get to choose your own project at the end because they obviously have to be vetted. So if you're... Uh, Proposed ideas aren't very good, then you're going to have a situation where no one's going to choose and you're not going to be able to run your own project. So we're going to talk about some of the... What is a good project? Yeah, what's propose. a good project? So you, you basically have a, a form to fill out and it's a very, very short description of a problem. And that's the first place where students can go wrong is the, the sort of describing, how to describe the problem effectively. Uh, those proposals then come in and staff choose them. They choose which ones are interesting, which ones are fascinating, which ones are just downright weird. Mm. Um, and then that list goes back to students and then students can pick basically any project from that list. Um, Whether your own or someone else's. Yeah. So what are, what, I mean, what are some of the good projects that, uh, I mean, if we just run through topics, what are some of the topics you picked this year? Uh, topics I picked, anything with space, I picked that. I thought those were quite entertaining ones because they tend to be somewhat out of the ordinary and it then forces the students to have to tackle things they wouldn't necessarily have tackled before. So if they're able to solve problems, identify the problems, analyze, optimize and things, um, in those conditions, we haven't necessarily covered stuff in courses. Okay, where it's so not space new. topics, what other topics? Uh, fast things. Fast things, yeah. Fast things, uh, Give me, give me a minute. All right, Mark. Okay, so the, 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 the topics which I got this year were sort of uh, extremely low cost farming equipment, mm -hmm. which is a uh, which is an interesting thing. Um, a beached whale rescue system. Uh, obviously, there's one or two aircraft projects. One, one was a nocturnal aerobatic aircraft for nocturnal air shows with lights, lasers. Uh, explosive smoke I think it's basically one where if I look at the problem I think oh wow how would I solve that and I can't right. immediately think of a solution yes I want to do that yes that uses a lot more words to basic word. what I try to say was tricky <laughs> you added the, the comprehension to it exactly because the thing is if you say it's like it, it's a gearbox for a solar car it's like well I know what the solution is it's boring to me it yeah. is boring to me because it's going to be the best selection of what's currently out there. Yeah. there there doesn't you know there isn't anything new i mean there's certainly room for adjusting their project or making their project unique or going something no one's done before but just knowing how students work in a fourth year project they will go and do it the same way it's always yeah. been and done. what's interesting is if if it was uh, a slightly different application so gearbox for a solar car immediately two constraints are in the problem yeah in which case well how much freedom do you have and the thing is, if you don't have that much freedom, it's not that interesting to do. And there's not much design meat in it. Nah. But yeah. if it was a moonlight-powered racing vehicle, I bet you'd pick it. Oh, hell yes. Exactly. <laughs> in because, a heartbeat. Well, you just think, how the hell do you even do that? And then, well, and, and if you started to unpack the problem, instantly you're going off with, on a road, 
when it's dark, there's radiation on mm. the road. Yeah. You could use that. Yeah. Um, when the sunset, there's different wind, wind and stuff that happens. Um, property of air, it changes a little bit when, when, when it's done. Um, but admittedly, you might have to do a little bit of analysis and, you know, yeah. I mean, the thing might end up being chained to three werewolves to pull it down the road or something. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, fundamentally, whatever is proposed, there is always room for adjustments and, and for, uh, so, you know, you, you say it's a moonlight powered vehicle, you know, you adjust it so it's radiation powered mm. from, from the road. Um, expect that to happen because then as whoever your supervisor ends up being, their hop, most of their role is to make sure that you've got something to do. And when it quickly becomes apparent that maybe there is nowhere near enough energy in moonlight to power your vehicle, you need to adjust. You don't just say, I'm done, and that, that's it, we can't. Um, so certainly don't think that just because you've happened to put down your favorite idea and you get chosen it, that that's necessarily you're restricted to have to do that. I, I think the other advice I've got is don't come up with a really cool concept. Like don't no. invent a Superman suit or a, a thing that belongs in the next James Bond movie mm. and then think, I, I want to pose a project where this thing is the answer. Exactly. Yeah. That's the wrong way to do it. Also, it's incredibly easily apparent to us that that's exactly yes. what you're doing, yeah. which means that when we're wanting to see that you've looked at alternative ideas, when we looked at you see you've optimized we don't want to choose that project because you really have your so-called optimized solution all the way at the back there. You're going to force everything to get to that route and you're going to put us in the horrible position of having to say, no, you can't do design yeah. um, before you even started. So, Constantine, what does the word open-ended mean to you? In design context. There's, there's no, no, I figured, <laughs> there's, there's no clearly defined solution. Well, there's no clearly defined problem. Or as well. And then even more so when it comes to yeah. sort of solution time. So, yeah, open-ended. If, if, if I think about what an open-ended design project would entail, to me it means that I'll probably have to do a lot of, shall we call it, creatively analytical thinking. Mm. Mm. There's, there's, like, it's not a straight line. It's, it's, you'll have to try something that you wouldn't necessarily think would work, but you're like, this is the best idea I have right now. Let's see where that train of thought takes me. And then if it goes well, cool, you do that again. If it doesn't, you go back and then you start again with, okay, that didn't work. Let's try this instead. And then you approach it from that angle. That's perfect because analytical means breaking things down. Yeah. So you have to break the thing down, but you could do it by trial and error for quite a huge amount of effort until yeah. you actually know this is open-ended problem that now is resolved down and now I can apply, you know, the standard um, sort of design uh, process to it. Yeah. Procedural versus non-procedural, Mr. Shepard. So procedural then I would say is a case of every subsequent step is known in advance. And it comes from a textbook probably. Probably comes from a textbook. Worst case, it comes from your supervisor. You will do this, and then you will do this, and then you will do this, which you should be very worried about if that's happening because that's yes. not how design works, and you're going down a very dangerous path. Your supervisor may pass you, by the way, but there's still an external examiner who will, yeah. who will then and have a... And your future boss might not like that. <laughs> oh, exactly. Um, so you don't want procedural. You want non-procedural where it's a case of, as Con said, you have a, a decision, you make that decision, and... You need to evaluate was that decision good or not and understand there is going backwards. Most procedures don't do step one, step two, step three, step one, step two, step five, step four, step one, step two, step five, step six, six, seven. Yeah. That, that's non-procedural. Um, and that's generally how a good design ends up being formed. And, and I think a good design process is a mix of procedural and non-procedural. Oh, yeah. But to figure out a problem, that's generally non-procedural. Mm, very much so. Yeah, yeah it, it's your... Once you, there, there's certain cap points, you know, I've defined the problem. Now there, there's a definitive next step. Yes. All right. Now, knowing the problem, what are you supposed to do about that problem? That's a, a def, easy to find a clear next point. Knowing your, your next step of this is what I need to do, it's you need to draw up a list of requirements or you need to draw up a list of, of factors that are going to govern that design, your, your PRS, your RS, whatever you want to call it. Um, what is constituted as part of those points, what breaks up and makes up those points, that's 
sort of non-procedural. There's no definitive way of getting, right, if you look up this information source, this source, this website, this book, this person, blah, blah, then you have it all. That's non-procedural. Um, and then thereafter, you've got ideas. So a, a procedural idea and that you've got that, but thereafter, it almost becomes completely non-procedural to the end. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because so, I just had the thought now. Yeah. If Because one of, one of the approaches you can have, especially to... Um, What's the term? Uh, repetitive design. Iterative design. Iterative, thank you. Um, is you can kind of like flow chart your mental, uh, your, your thought process. But if at the end of the project, your flow chart is one, is like baby's first flow chart, there, 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 just in a straight line. Left to right, yes. Mm -hmm. For the audio listeners. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not a good project. No, well, I mean, at the very least, if you start concerning, so your project's not only just marked against marks, uh, you know, at the end. Okay, we're getting off topic of just finding and choosing a project, oh, yeah. but um, when your your project is marked, it's also evaluated against ELOs, exit level outcomes, and those are kind of like a, a checklist, basically, of things you need to be able to show you can do. And if you go left to right, not a single tangent, not a single branched route or anything like that. You, you can't. You unfortunately, especially with design ELO one and three, you can't satisfy it. Right. So if, if we just go back to the start, proposing a, a project requires you to have a problem which you propose. I find that students sometimes struggle in communicating what the problem is, but mm. supervisors can kind of see through that. They yeah. can read it and say, "This is fascinating." Yeah. Uh, we need to just drop that word because that, that that sort of implies a constraint. We'll get rid of that thing. Um, mm. and maybe substitute this thing in, in, in for that, uh, and, and then you have it. Uh, if we run through, part of posing a problem is part of the EL01. So EL01 is all about problem solving. Yeah. Now, a problem solving is if, you, you know, if, this, if the project is relatively weak and you don't do a very good job at unpacking it when you do it, regardless of everything else that you do, how well you write it up, how well your design process is, it's flawed. Mm. So, you know, are you solving the right problem? Is it a problem worth solving? That's sort of ELO one. Uh, the other big one is obviously ELO three, which requires you to do an open-ended design problem to narrow it down to something which is, is doable. And again, we said before that, you know, a single fourth year, nine weeks later, well, proper design of a much better wheelbarrow is what's possible. Yeah. You know, if you are designing yeah. a, a moon powered rally cross vehicle, uh, well, you'd have geometry and you'd have wheel loading and you'd have uh, a propulsion system and you'd have traction system and maybe you'd have a things like that you might get down to chassis and mm. chassis might be your detailed design yeah or else if the moon is the biggest constraint then the propulsion system exactly. or oh, yeah, exactly. is your, yeah. your detailed design yeah. is but at the end of the eight weeks if you were to go and make it you could probably 3d print a little model of some incomplete cat and that's about as far as you're going to get yeah, yeah. but if you design the chassis, the, sh the, sh the chassis should work, but they're not going to be wheels or brakes or anything else. Uh, so I think then a, a good point to then make with that when looking at proposing your project, you're not getting something where, you know, say you've got this own personal project in the back that you've been thinking through all these years and now suddenly let off the leash, you can run at it. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to solve it unless you're designing the new wheelbarrow, very creative and imaginative of you. Uh, but if it is those big projects and they tend to be for a lot of you, you're not going to necessarily solve that. So either be aware of that and where you're just going to make a couple steps within that idea and within solving that bigger problem uh, or save that as a sideline for your hobby um, and choose something else that is maybe more nine-week possible. Should um, we try and come up with a couple of problems that, that you know, if, if we were third years going into fourth year, they'd be kind of fun things which... Uh, Ooh, okay, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think now on the spot. Luggage, which doesn't bounce over cobblestones. Oh, you know, yes. there's that thing where, <laughs> you know, if you've ever, and it doesn't matter, we're not talking about international travel or whatever, but no. I mean, you, you know, the start of each term, I see students with suitcases hmm. lugging them up and down Yale Road, and the thing is over bricks or anything, suitcases bounce and the wheels break off, etc. How difficult is it to design something which is designed for that? Yeah. You know, all, all these design houses, you know, back in the dark end of Milan in Italy, they have, you know, Ferrari engineered smooth tiles. Um, little plastic wheels will work fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, 
you know, you, you, you catch a bus back home, you've got to lug a suitcase half a K down a dirt road, that suitcase is going to do 10 trips and it's bust. Exactly. Yeah. Again, you, we're not deciding what the, the, the design actually is. Yeah, we're, we're saying, not saying how to solve it, we're no. just saying what the problem is. We're not even saying what you're designing. Yes. Mm. Um, all right, now that's a cool one. Uh, I'm, I'm still thinking. No, 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 so am I. So that's why you're on the spot, spotlight here. Just start talking. <laughs> hmm. what, what really bugs you? Home environment. I love to think. You know what? You know, so I, I stay relatively high up in an apartment, um, ninth floor, and cleaning a window. When, and you know, there's, there's no ledge. I've stood on that ledge. It's not safe at all. Um, Cleaning a window, those magnetic things that no, they, they don't work. They you know, attach a string to it all you bloody want. That's not going to work. Um, there is no way I'm getting a high-pressure cleaner to blast those windows. I'm pretty certain I'm breaking through a window in that place. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's certainly a problem that I'd have a look at. Yeah, show me how to solve that. Um, so, one of the things that bugs me the most at the moment is the neighbor's baby it Ooh. it goes it goes zero to scream every single time 24 hours of the day uh ELO so, 10 does deal with professionalism and ethics so you have to be very careful yeah, the route you take I was, with this I, was, I was getting there so so okay. so <laughs> I, I would suggest uh you know we should never dive into concerts but concert one would be a set of earplugs <laughs> yes so but I, I was thinking right what is a because this is also in a complex. You can't obviously do anything to the baby because of ethical reasons. Mm. You can't really do anything majorly obtrusive to the neighbor either. It's no. so like putting up a massive... Like, Be a better mom. Yeah, yeah putting up a massive <laughs> wall or something. So you could try to design something um, that basically negates the noise. I mean, I know you like... like You're if, jumping into design. Yes. I'm, <laughs> you've, done, you've done the classic thing so, that students do is yes. a, a, a device to uh, you know suppress baby screaming. Yeah. Okay. So something that unobtrusively clears the screaming out of your home environment. Is that the actual problem though? Is it that you can't sleep? Is it that you, you can't work? Is it that you just can't concentrate in general day to day? I would just so, turn my chins up if that's so the problem. The, the, the problem is there is noise in the house that is biologically designed to cut through whatever noise you put into your own ears and trigger your lizard brain yes, to it's true. react uh, anxiously. Mm -hmm. One of the other ones, uh, as in terms of a problem that I sort of had a brief glance of this year that I wouldn't mind actually tackling more and more of, is the idea of like looking really fine in the future. Don't tackle the now problem. Predict the future problems mm. Mm, and solve one of those. So the one I had this year was a um, uh, – it dealt with space travel of, of a sort. Um, and in a, the, the problem ended up being redefined to something in the future. Not now, not a current problem, but one that is to come. And that's unique because <sighs> – the, there is not much evidence to support that that problem will exist. It's almost like a prediction thereof. And that's the thing which students also need to understand is that, you know, whenever you go and look up data, it is historic data. Yeah. It's been collected for one, two, a hundred, three hundred thousand years. And, you know, you, you take uh, climate change, etc. It's historical sort of based. But, you know, if, if you were to make a model of anything now, how accurate is it? Yeah. And the, the world is changing so quickly. Um, I mean, look at technology. Look at the way it progresses. Yeah. Um, mm. Not even trying to do that whole thing of how transistors double in power every so many years, whatever the case is, but just in the leaps and bounds of aerial systems and vehicle systems, we're seeing now self-driving cars when that for a long time was a dream. So if we stick on the self-driving car thing, yeah. and let's say we wanted to come up with a cool design project proposal on the that's the theme mm. but what are the problems associated with it if we were to try and come up with three proposals that are based on the self-driving car what are they i mean it is one i think it's really kind of been solved or at least being solved currently but the the 
outside people? How do you deal with the fact that you've got a varying, very, a very varying world and dynamic world? So you've got a smart thing operating within dumb a people. whole lot of dumb things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and ways to tackle that problem, whether it's a I mean, that that might come down to an industrial type project of a how how do you um, program it and how do you teach it this is right and this is wrong to a way of fine, you're going to hit the person a... Then what? Yeah, exactly. A a then what? And I think that the important thing is, is this problem at the highest level in terms of levels of design, you could try and and, and propose a problem which is a mechatronics or sort of control Mm. type thing. And there's an avenue of that, which is then the um, AI machine learning aspect of it. Then there's the good old mechanical story. Yeah. So it is a self-driving car. It doesn't have to, I mean, theoretically, cars are designed with airbags and roll cages and stuff like that because humans have traditionally wrapped them around trees and raced them on Friday nights and things like yeah. that. Theoretically, with the self-driving cars, you could get rid of all of that stuff. We could literally go back to the good old fa- fashioned kind of open horse-drawn cart, if yeah. you think about it. You might counter the argument with, no, you can't currently because people are still not driving um, all self-driving cars. But then that's the whole thing of, let's look a bit in the future exactly. when yeah. everyone is self-driving. Yeah. Design the future self-driving car in yeah. a world of only self-driving. And the whole thing is, if you take the, how pedestrians interact with the current crazy drivers in cars, their behavior is sort of offensive or defensive response to, to yeah. driving yeah. behavior. If the driving behavior of vehicles improves, pedestrians will automatically adapt to that new environment. You learn to. Yeah. So, again, that's a really tricky problem to try and define, <laughs> to try and do. Um, that particular one would be more on the research side of things. Probably. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the, the hardcore design um, stuff, there there's certainly a whole lot of meat there. But you'll notice we haven't mentioned a single thing about drivetrain for a self-driving car no. or the propulsion system for it because no. those things already exist yeah. and those things are not open-ended enough yeah yeah basically a given but w- what would the future chassis be hmm. or i mean e- even future ergonomics yeah or, and let's even say that we're going to allow for safety systems so one of the self-driving cars explosively decompresses or who god knows what wheels come off and it crashes and the rest of the cars aren't able to stop in time hmm. Now, you don't need everyone facing forward. Exactly. The safest position is actually facing backwards. Yeah. Exactly. So, design the new safety system where it rotates your seat, you know, in 0.3 of a second, rotates your seat 180 degrees backwards and flips you so that no matter how, whatever angle you hit, you're always yeah. pointing in the right direction. Okay, we're without jump- giving you whiplash. Exactly. <laughs> we're jumping into design so, ideas. So, instantly, but what you've, you've proposed there is a safety cell, which could be fit to anything. Airplanes, it, trains. Yeah. And, and that's what you've got to try and do. You've got to think, ah, safety system. Ah, but it's not just for self-driving cars. This thing could be used everywhere. Yeah. yeah. The, univ- uh, the universal yeah. um, safety cell. I mean, if you just take a modern automobile, a chassis is designed for rollover safety, side impact protection, all of that stuff. All of that stuff adds mass, which yet has knock-on effects to the chassis. Yeah. Yeah. And... The suspension, the drivetrain, the tires, the brakes, everything is designed for that mass and that weight distribution. Yeah. If you just were to take 50 kilos of structure out of the chassis of a car, you'd need different brakes. You need different wheels, you need different tires, you need different engine, you need different everything else. Yeah. And, that, and that iteration is... Uh, you might end up regressing down to all the tech, cheaper tech, because yes. your system is now completely different. Yes. Yeah, you don't need all that other stuff. I mean, and that's half the thing is that you, you see a lot of these systems, maybe more in tech these days than anything else, where when they come out, people say, well, what the hell is that for? What does that solve? Mm. Yeah. Whether it's the first VR goggles or the first iPads when they came out. Some people looking, no, you don't need that. That's silly. I've got a computer and I've got a, a cell phone. What the hell would I ever use this for? Yeah. But it, it is now a big mainstream thing because someone looked a bit into a problem that is to come and they started to solve that problem. Yeah. Yeah. So Um, why is it that old stuff keeps coming back? I mean, last year, there were no skateboards on campus. This year, there's skateboards on campus. I think, well, something like that, I think is more of a... um, 
nostalgia. No, 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 nostalgia. I mean, you're playing a, a psychological game with society. Yeah. Um, but is it, it's an easy, I mean, I used one to go to school on when I was a kid. I mean, sure. it's an easy way to travel. And certainly it was cooler than the assholes on bikes. Or those push scooters or whatever the case oh, is. Oh, okay. those chads. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Best thing ever is carrots up the exhaust. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Cool. Cool.